Okay, it is 12.12 12 p.m. on uh, the 29th of December, 2015. Uh, the comments, the questions, are there's a whole lot of them. So I decided I'm going to try to get to answering these because there's other plans I have for later on. So it's not quite a week that I had it up, but I think that there's enough questions out there for me to answer. <laughs> going to take quite some time. A few little things I wish I had done, and if I do this again, I'm going to be doing a little bit differently, is I'm going to say one question per person. Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of people replying and things like that, which is fine. I saw some of you replied and sent links to videos and things. We'll be talking about that. And so thank you for that. But uh, a lot of the replies back and forth, back and forth, I'm not going to answer those. Uh, the, you know, it's just going to be the actual questions I'm going to answer. I should have made a statement about that. But um, so that's what I'm going to do. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, I have the video unlisted right now, so there's not going to be any other questions coming in. And I'm going to start from the newest first and work my way down. Okay, so we are going to be starting out here. Let's write, write this down with Petra Paul. Question, what do you know about Melchizedek? Thanks. Well, the word Melchizedek, uh, in the Old Testament, if I get it right the way that they have it spelled there, with, you know, you can see it on your screen. Uh, it appears first in Genesis 14, verse 18, and then in Psalm 110, verse 4. Okay, you say, well, who is it ref in reference to? Well, if you're turning your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 through chapter 7, there's a bunch of more references to it, and it's spelled a little bit different, but it's the, the same uh, being that we're reading about here. Uh, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 says, So it also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, capital S there, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Verse 10, called, in, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, jump down to chapter 7 there, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Okay, so you see there a reference back to what's going on in, in Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter, what did I say it was? Chapter 14, verse 18. So what do we have here? Well, Melchizedek was Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate form. In other words, he came, he was not known as Jesus Christ until... Uh, the Holy Ghost came upon Mary and, and she was with child with Jesus and he was born. But in the Old Testament, he appears in different forms and things. One of them is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that's what that is. Um, what do I know about him? Well, it's Jesus in a pre-incarnate form. So that would be my answer to that question. So next we will go to Ravender... Jit Singh. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 38 through 39. Uh, it's Matthew 24, verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as to prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay. I don't, I don't really know what the question would be there. It's... Um, I guess I don't know if, if you're trying to say that you know it's the same event or something like that um, well um, no I don't believe that that would be quite the same event there um, you know I think that, uh, that certainly uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3 is not talking about saved people it's talking about lost people so don't know what else to tell you on that one um Ry Fra, Ryan Fraser. I'll do his question next. He says, I posted a question about the rapture and have been answered when I looked into Dr. Douglas Stauffer's videos on the pre time of Jacob's trouble catching away. I had to delete them because I answered the questions myself. 
I found an 1836 KJV, and, and in the back there are the Psalms of David in meter, translations and paraphrase, paraphrases and verse of several scriptures, which consist of many chapters written in song poetic form, such as Genesis 1-1, Let heaven arise, let earth appear, said the Almighty Lord. The heaven arose, the earth appeared at his word, as well as five hymns. Have you seen this written in any of your many versions? Thank you, Brother Brian, and Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas to you, too. Um, no, I haven't. I, I actually never really even searched for that. Um, sounds like an interesting thing, uh, definitely. Um, and, you know, I do recommend uh, Doug Stauffer. He's got some really good stuff. And he's a defender of the uh, pre-time of Jacob's Trouble catching away, which is a good thing. Next we have Titus to Mother. Okay. What do Bible believers, why do Bible believers refer to the city on seven hills when that is nowhere in the scripture? There are seven mountains in Revelation, but again, not hills. I'm a Bible believer 100%, and ha but have been confused as to this reasoning. Can you elaborate? Okay. Um, let me just check on that real quickly here. I have my sword searcher software over on this monitor um, using an older... Uh, we had two monitors, an older one, and then this one here. So I have them set up. You've probably seen that in other videos, but uh, makes it a lot handier when you're doing um, uh, video editing and things like that. Yeah, definitely, it does not say hills. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I'll I'll show you about this in just a minute. But uh, let me just look here. Uh, seven. See where is the verse at? Revelation 17, verse 9. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is mountains. Uh, we should be saying mountains. And uh, just to show you kind of a, a little, another thing that happens a lot of times with Bible believers. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Period. Have you ever heard people quote it and they say there's no remission of sins? Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins? That's not what the text says. Now, it's implied. It's there. You know, you can see it. But uh, there's something within the body of Christ where things are repeated, and they're repeated, and they're repeated, and repeated, and, all, and it kind of takes over what the actual text says. And it's wrong. We shouldn't do that. Um, the text does say seven mountains. Okay, so it should be... I apologize for saying seven hills. I think in one of my uh, recent videos I said something about seven hills. Uh, uh, the, the one on the uh, Coca-Cola thing that they were on the hills and things. Uh, no, it was actually mountains. I should have said mountains. I apologize. Uh, definitely should be mountains. Next we have John Michael. I'm just going to write these down that way when it comes time to, you know, put this into a video, I can put in the comment section, you know, who all is answered in this video. John Michael, can you explain the way that post-tribbers get into talking in tongues, other doctrines such as replacement theology, while pre-trib Christians don't get into this? What's the link with post-tribulationism and regeneration? Does regeneration happen with pre-trib dispensationalism? Thank you in Christ Jesus, John Michael. Uh, well, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, our final book of the Bible is Revelation. And it's, it's, it's a very, very profound, you know, aptly named book. Because as we get closer to this time, there's more and more things that are being revealed. And at one point in time, I would have said, you know, I really, if you watch some of my older videos, I say, you know, post-tribbers, you know, I think that there are a lot of post-tribbers that are saved, they're just deceived. And... You know, as time goes by, it's like it's it's so clear. You know, as I do studies in the scriptures, it's just like it can't be post-trib. It would cause all kinds of doctrinal error. You have replacement theology. You have eternal security. You know, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise right now. They're not in the time of Jacob's trouble. You have all kinds of errors and heresy coming out because you go post-trib. 
And I realize that there are some people that have just been totally deceived on this issue, and I'm not going to judge their salvation. But when you have these teachers coming out and just absolutely vehemently attacking what they would call the pre-trib rapture, I think... I think that there's some salvation issues going on there. Why? Well, Jesus Christ said that He is the resurrection. What is the rapture? It's the resurrection. So you are effectively rejecting Jesus Christ. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But according to post-tribbers, we're not. Or they'll try to pretend that we are. It's, it's just, it makes a lot of problems. And so, you know, you know, what's the link with post-tribulationism and regeneration? Is somebody really regenerated? If I'm getting your question correctly, uh, John, um, I would say, you know, again, you know, I think that there's, you know, Acts chapter 17 talks about the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Uh, there have certainly been things that have been popular among Christians at different times, and you know, it's because there's so much ignorance on the issue, but then something comes out, the truth comes out, and, you know, now it's like God commands all, all men everywhere to repent. I think the good example of that is church buildings. You know, Christians weren't meeting in church buildings for a very, very, very long time. And then in the 1700s, it started to happen, then it got more and more popular to now where a lot of you know, professing Christians, I'll say that, you know, just they don't even question it anymore. It's somehow sinful to not go to a church building. But see, as more and more information comes out, and about 501c3, the sin of being yoked up to the federal government, and, you know, the fact that there are so many problems associated with church buildings, they are pagan temples, is what those things really are, um, based on Greek Parthenons and obelisks as the uh, steeple. I mean, there, there's all kinds of problems, brethren. Uh, Christians should not be meeting in those places. They never should have. Okay, it was never right. It was always wrong. But I think there was some ignorance in the past that God winked at. But now he's commanding all men everywhere to repent. And this post-trib stuff, the times of ignorance in the past, God winked at. But I believe he's commanding all men everywhere to repent. I mean, there are so many good arguments now for the body of Christ leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, it's just, it's not even an option. You know, it's its just, it's ridiculous that anybody even be post-trib. So, post-trib, tribulationism and regeneration, I would say somebody that's truly saved will be, you know, pre-trib, if you want to use that term. Um, they'll get there eventually. But when you have these people that are just like so, just vehemently prideful, just no way, no way, no way, no way, uh, do I question their salvation? Yeah, I, quite frankly, I do. Uh, when the Holy Spirit, or when the Spirit of uh, Truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. The Bible says. So, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to question people's salvation. Um, certainly, there are new believers that have been deceived into believing in it, but I think that the false converts, ironically, the false converts that are saying I'm post-trib, uh, well, they they actually are. <laughs> you know, they're actually going into that time period without even realizing it. So, they're defending their own, you know, the truth of their own position. If they're not regenerated, then they're going into it. All right. So, that hopefully will answer your question. Carol Sparks is next. She says, I listen to your teaching a lot and usually am blessed by your teaching. However, it seems to me that when you respond to criticism that you do not follow 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24, or 20, yeah, 24 through 26, I go there in my Bible. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, uh, which says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Can you explain, please, you and your family are in my prayers? Well, you know, my answer to that question is I can speak for an hour uh, and be very gentle and very meek and things like I'm doing right now. I'm not calling anybody names or anything. And some guy can come out and just be totally wicked and I can say that guy's a blaspheming idiot. And all people remember is 10 seconds of the whole sermon. And they say you were, you were militant, you were, you were uh, name calling, sarcastic, all this other stuff. Um, you watch the majority of my preaching, 
I am very, very gentle and meek with people. I want to see people get saved. I want to see people turn to the truth. And I have been, again, people don't understand how, how much grace I have had for people. I mean, I will let some people that are questionable, I'll let them go for years without rebuking them. You know, just watching them and seeing, you know, which way are they going to go here and, and everything. And then I see them go off the deep end and start attacking me personally, start attacking, and you know, attacking me personally is not going to really anger me that much. When I get angry is when I, you know, when I see somebody attacking vital doctrine and deceiving people. That's what gets me fired up. That's when I start to get sarcastic. And ironically, that's what you see with Jesus and, of course, Paul also. Um, and I've gone over those scriptures before. We're not going to cover them. Uh, but it talks about rebuking people sharply. And that's what I do. Um, I, when I rebuke somebody, when I get sarcastic and harsh, it's because I'm trying to turn people away from that person because I can see that if you go and you listen to them, you're going to get destroyed. Uh, right now, you know, there's been a controversy with Brian Moonan. Um, I knew about years ago, years and years ago, that his wife worked for the Department of Defense. Department of Defense people, uh, there are people within that military intelligence field that are specifically assigned to infiltrate Bible-believing groups and cause division. And Brian Moonan has also worked for and continues to work for professional television. That's why you look at a lot of his videos, they're very professional. And see, people confuse that for sound doctrine. Uh, that's a problem. You know, Moonan is a false prophet. And now he's going, well, he's, I can't say now he's going post-trib. He's been post-trib. He even said it in his, in his video. I, I made a thing on that. So if you start to listen to Brian Moonan, you're going to get off in that area. And you're going to start to fall for replacement theology. Sam Adams that Brian Moonan's working with. Sam Adams teaches replacement theology. You're going to start to question eternal security. You're going to start to, it's, it's going to fall apart. See? So I rebuke sharply. Right? You can't say, let's just use these verses, 24 through 26, which I do practice, by the way. Let's use these verses and forget all the verses that talk about rebuking people sharply. You know, marking them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoiding them. You know, let's forget those verses and just focus on this. Well, I do both. All right, the majority of my work, I'm very... I try to be very, very meek. Yes, there are times I get sarcastic, but it's because, you know, I'm trying to warn people, right? So, uh, hopefully that will answer that question, Carol. Um, Brianna. Brianna. Lee. Is it Beno? I'm not sure I might be pronouncing that right. Um, she says, okay, I finally have a question, and it's not for myself. I just finished Second Chronicles, and it got me thinking. What does the Bible say about free will? I've read comments where people actually claim we have no free will because the Lord knows what we are going to do before we do it. I don't think people fully understand free will. Interested on what you would have to say, brother. Okay, uh, Free will is something that everybody has. Right? I can show you one of the greatest verses on that. Um, I think in here... Acts chapter 17, I actually referred to this earlier. By the way, if you hear some noise in the background there as far as like a fan blowing, I have a, we have a pellet stove right over here. So it's very cold out today. It's about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so um, above zero. It was below zero overnight, so not going to be able to shut the stove off while I do videos. But... Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay? Um, do all repent. The verse says God commands everybody to repent. All men everywhere to repent. So does everybody repent? No. What does that prove? You say, well, that proves that there are some that are elect and some that are non-elect. And the elect can repent and the non-elect can't. Well, then why would God command all of them to repent? It doesn't make any sense. God commands all men everywhere to repent. He says, salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Get saved. Every knee shall bow, you know. But they still have a free will. You say, but what about God knowing who's going to get saved and who's going to be lost? Well, sure. But there, God is in eternity. God is outside of our time here. So he can look and, you know, you get to up to heaven. You're, it's, you're in a, a place where there is no time, where it's, 
he could see from start to finish. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows exactly what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble and the millennial kingdom and everything. He's got that whole thing. He can see the whole thing. You say, well, explain it. I can't explain that stuff, okay? <laughs> I mean, God is so much higher than us. And what I think a lot of these Calvinists, what they do, where their error comes in, is they fall for what goes on back there with Satan in the Garden of Eden, his lie to Eve, and that is ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. And that, to me, is Calvinism, okay? Uh, they know the good, the elect, and the, the evil, the non-elect. They are as gods. They can say, well, so-and-so is obviously non-elect. They were, you know, they never had a chance or something. Absolutely ridiculous. All we can do down here is understand that, yes, God has the whole thing planned to make you feel safe, knowing that God has everything in his plan, and he does. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows the day of your death or the day of your being called up to be with him in the air. Um, there's really nothing to worry about. He has everything planned out. But you have a free will to do whatever you want. Okay, I have a free will. I could open up a new tab here and go and look up pornography. God's not going to stop me from doing that. But God's going to punish me if I do it. You see? Somebody can come along to this ministry and they can come in and they can say, I reject Jesus Christ. They have a free will to do that. God did not make them do that. And there are scripture after scripture after scripture talking about this. All right, so, uh, yes, we do have free will. And I could talk for a very long time on that subject, but I'm trying to get through these questions. All right, this next one will be fun, I'm sure. Whitey knows best 777. This looks like it's going to be a long one. We'll just try to get through this thing here. Uh, here we go. The lost tribes of Israel are not Jews. They are European that migrated toward Europe. No, they're not. <laughs> uh, there was a guy, uh, I think it was Armstrong, I think. James Armstrong, or I think so. But he came up with this British Israelism thing. It's just another form of uh, replacement theology. It's not that the church has replaced Israel. It's that the, it's the white you know, Europeans that are the Jews, you know, stupid, but let's read it, um, they became the Scythians, then later the Anglo-Saxons, the Scandinavians, and the Germanic people, which is why Christianity was a white man's religion, sure, uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, James 1.1, 1, 1. so according to all th to this, all twelve tribes exist, so what happened to the lost tribes then, okay, Lamentations 4 7 says, Her Nazarites were purer than snow, they were whiter than milk, they were more rude, ruddy in body than rubies, their polishing was a sapphire, Jesus is a Nazarite, so they are white, Jesus is white. Revelation 1 14 says, His hair is white and his head is white, also he has eyes as a flame of fire, uh, golden, blue, or green eyes. <laughs> oh, what? Huh? Okay. His eyes are as a flame of fire, so they're like green and blue. Okay, uh, wouldn't they also, could it also mean that they're orange and red, like fire? Yeah, but uh, this thing of, well, it says there in Lamentations 4, 7 that their Nazarites are whiter than, or purer than snow, whiter than milk. Okay, well, I'm German. I'm a Denlinger, okay? I'm German. So is my skin whiter than snow? You know, compare me, compare my skin here to my Bible. This is white pages. I'm not white kind of a peach collar, or not maybe peach, but I don't know. I don't know what collar you could say my skin is, but I'm not whiter than snow. It's speaking figuratively, obviously. Uh, there aren't pure white Jews walking around someplace in England or Germany. It's people are desperate, you know. And, uh, you know, in Revelation there where it says about his hair is, is white, that's the glorified Jesus Christ in heaven. When he was down here on the earth, his hair was not white. You know, actually back in the book of Song of Solomon, it talks about his hair was black and bushy. You know, Song of Solomon is a type of Jesus Christ, and it talks about his hair is black and bushy as a raven. So, nonsense. But let's continue here. I am saying that not all Israelites are Jews, Judeans. To say that all Israelites are Jews, Judeans, is like saying that all Americans are Texans. God told Abram that we will be the father of many nations, plural, 
That is why his na name is now Abraham. The Jews only have one nation, and there is only about 16 million Jews. God told Abram that his seed will be multiplied as the stars in heaven. Genesis 27:17. 17. 16 million is not even close, so it cannot be just Jews only, and history says otherwise. Israelites are white Jews. Judeans are white. We are Abraham's physical seed. Okay, uh, you know, a whole bunch of nonsense there. And again, this thing of the Jews are scattered, so that proves that it, it has to be the white Europeans and not the actual Jews. And it's so funny, because these guys, they'll say, the Jews are not the Jews, and you have to understand that, because we can prove that the Jews that are there are not the Jews that are the Jews that are mentioned in the Bible as the Jews. A couple screws loose up here. You know, maybe some demons in there too. But the fact is, the Jews, the true Jews, you know, the Israelites, those of Shem that come down through, that are in Israel today, as the Bible prophesies, those Jews, they are scattered. They've been persecuted now for, you know, since the first century. They've been persecuted like crazy. And they spread out all over the different nations. That's who it's talking about. Not white Europeans. Uh, Deuteronomy 15, verse 6 says that Israel shall rule over other nations. Genesis 22, verse 18 says that Israel shall be a blessing to other nations. A uh, thing about that, by the way, most Bible-believing churches are mostly white Israelites. Israel today cannot be called Israel. It should be called Judea. Israel belongs to the ten tribes. That land is not full of Europeans at all. Jews in that land are not even Christian, and many of them are not even Judeans. Revelation 2, 9 the Jews in the Bible are Judeans. Not all Israelites are Judeans. Judeans. Moses was not a Jew. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, it's news to me. He was a Levite. Same thing with the all non-Judean prophets. Okay. The word Jew first appears in 2 Kings, the 12th book of the Bible. So it does not exist in the first 11. Okay, they weren't called that up until then, you know. Uh... Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, this is an important verse. I'm not saying that those other races are worthless. Red, yellow, black, and white are all special. But God's uh, people are Israelites. Wait a second, I thought that the, Jew the Jews were the whites. <laughs> this individual is very confused. As the Bible say over and over, there are many, many historical evidences that prove that the Caucasians are the lost tribes of Israel. It makes sense the Assyrian Empire is below the Caucasus. Caucasus, they were captive north. They began to began to migrate north, then west. Eventually, they began to forget who they were. <laughs> just, just look at all these pagan European tribes that have lots of similar traditions as the Israelites. Also, the Vatican and, and the Jews. Not all Jews are Israelites. Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. This, and same thing with some white Europeans. The reprobate Catholics, a.k.a. Jesuits, and the reprobate Jews are a part of the same two-headed monster. You keep blaming the Vatican only when Jesuit Pope Francis sympathizes the Jews and their religion Judaism. Well, I hope that you're from another country and English is not your first language because if English is your first language and you're writing like that, um, I think you better just walk away from technology for a little while and just maybe go out and take a walk in the fresh air and, and uh, you know, actually get saved. Um, this this is not a safe person that would write this kind of level of insanity. Um, I mean, where do you even begin? You know, I mean, part of the prophecy for the nation of Israel. I mean, the, mo the simplest way to debunk any of this replacement theology, Satanism. The the greatest prophecies in Scripture are about the Jewish people coming back to their homeland, a physical piece of real estate, Jerusalem their capital city, and Israel, the nation. The Bible tells you where this land is. There's no question. There's no, well, it's actually in Harlem, if you're James Manning, the wacko that he is, or Phoenix, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona, wherever Anderson's little call it is, or, or wherever else. People believe it's in Texas and things like this. That's satanic is what it is. God made promises to Abraham and to his seed, his physical seed. Okay, we as Christians are born into it through adoption, but we're not the physical seed. I mean, there are physical seed Jewish Christians, but this kind of stuff is nonsense. Okay, uh, 
the Bible prophesies that the Jews would come back to their land. It's happened. That their language would be restored. It's happened. That their Old Testament practices, that they would restore that. It's happening. They're trying to rebuild the temple and get the animal sacrifices and everything going again. Um, so that's coming to pass as well. Uh, I mean, all this stuff is happening. But if you're into replacement theology, you say, well, the blacks are the true Jews or the whites are the true Jews or whatever other satanic nonsense you can come up with. Um, then get over to Israel and take over the land because that's where the promises are fulfilled. Kooky nonsense. All right. I'll leave the comment there for now, but uh, that's ridiculous. And I only answer this kind of satanic nonsense just for you out there. If you're going to, you know, you, you'll run into this too, whoever's watching this video. All right, next we have Brother Rick Estep. Brother Brian, you have accumulated quite a collection of videos. Have you cataloged these? In other words, can we search them by topic, date, or other method? No, I have not, Brother. Uh, that's that's um, a lot of work. And, you know, I'm trying to constantly do research right here. You know, I have, you can see that little paper sticking down right there. I'm up to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, going over scriptures to prove pre-time Jacob's trouble in the book of 2 Corinthians. I'm going to go through each of the Pauline epistles. And so there's lots of work to do there. Um, doing this, a lot of other work and things. So to go in and organize everything into playlists and organize everything into categories and stuff, uh, I wish I could. I mean, there's if I had more people you know, that, that uh, were able to work with this ministry and things, uh, it would be great, but I just don't know how to do that. I mean, I've had so many people now, you know, just do a 180 degree turn on me and one minute I'm wonderful and great. And the next minute I'm a heretic and they're making videos against me. So I'm just like, you know, if I had somebody here, you know, in this area, I mean, my wife is also busy with her own research, so she can't really do a whole lot there. Uh, my son, you know, he's not going to be involved in this stuff either. So, you know, a little bit too young too, but, um, you know, some of that stuff, I, I don't know if it's ever going to get done, to be quite honest. So, uh, sorry, I don't have it better organized. But uh, next we have Best Affy, or Best Faffy, sorry. Best Faffy. Okay. Hi, Brian. Hi. Uh, I have no experience with the heretical doctrine of Judaiz Judaiz Judaizers. I know that some preachers in Italy are starting to spread this heresy but I'm not ready to face this people. I need help, and I need it quickly. Uh, thank you, and God bless you and your family. Okay, um, I'm not sure which way we're going on this thing here, which way you're trying to say whether people trying to spread Judaism um, and trying to get people back under the law, like was going on in the book of Galatians. Um, let me look up a verse here very quickly. Uh, that can be there. And there's another thing, uh, let's see here, I'm trying to think, yeah, uh, Titus, um, Titus chapter 1 verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always uh, liars, or always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Okay? Um, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, and but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Uh, describes a lot of the people that go into the Hebrew Roots movement or people trying to go back under the law and say that, you know, it's not just uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Now there, you have to also keep the commandments. You have to keep things to be saved. It's a, Salvation is always a process. It's never completed. Okay, um, that's a problem. Uh, you know, the Hebrew roots thing, if people are trying to say that they're changing their names and, and they're saying I'm, you know, trying to make a Jewish name for themselves and they start to get into the King James Bible, 
and they start to change names. They don't say Jesus, they say Yeshua. Or my favorite, they'll say Yahashua, which is Joshua in Hebrew, which is like Joshua didn't die on the cross. I mean, I know Jesus and Joshua are similar. There's some relation there, some interesting things, but with what Joshua did in the Old Testament, but that's another study. But, uh, you know, to call Jesus Yahashua is not correct. And, you know, it's just kind of funny. So, again, you know, you're dealing with another form of replacement theology if it's the Hebrew roots thing. If it's people trying to get you back under the law, you know, uh, just remind them of the book of Galatians. You know, I would say that'd be your best bet. Um, book of Galatians really debunks the whole thing of having to go back under the law to be saved and having to act like you're Jewish. Uh, that's not there. And, of course, you have the council in... Um, let me look it up here, make sure I get the scripture reference correct. Um, the Lord's helped me to learn the scriptures pretty well, but uh, the chapter and verse, that's that's still kind of tough for me. I can have a hard time with some of them. Um, yeah, Acts chapter 15. Uh, and certain men which came down from, verse 1, from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Okay, they were trying to bring people back under the law. And you can read the whole chapter there. They go into a meeting and they don't tell them, you know, you have to keep the law to be saved. They don't tell them that. Um, so, yeah, just real quickly here, uh, verse 28 and 29 in Acts 15 says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Okay, so what are the things that they lay upon them? The Jews are saying that the Gentile Christians are going to have to do this. Verse 29, that ye abstain from meats offered idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So those are the things that you carry over from Judaism to Christianity now, as far as, uh, you know what I'm saying, Old Testament Jews keeping the law um, to now people that are in the, the body of Christ. So that would be my answer there. Acts 15 and the book of Galatians to debunk this whole thing of people saying you have to go back under the law, you have to act like you're Jewish, you have to change the Bible to read like, you know, Hebrew or something. Okay, next we have Spooky Elk. What about getting a marriage license? I recall from another video that it's wrong to get one. I'm not yet married yet, but I'm courting someone and was wondering... Uh, what is a biblical way to get married? Thank you kindly. Well, hopefully you're uh, going to marry another elk, spooky elk, because if you try to marry a moose or something, you might become a, a loose or perhaps a, a mook or something. Just kidding. I had to put that in there. <laughs> um, what about the thing of a state marriage license? Okay. Um, again, you know, this is something that there's a lot of legal stuff there and uh, we'd like to do, I mean, we have some law dictionaries and things here, Black's Law Dictionary, and it actually does talk about the thing of uh, marriage covenant slash coverture um, and a state marriage license. And uh, essentially, whenever you go to the government for a license, you are getting their official permission to do something. And I realize that if you, you know, there are people that get into the thing, I've seen actually people that do not even have driver's licenses. And they'll drive a vehicle, and you get into all kinds of legal stuff there, and you got to know laws of the common man and stuff like this. Um, common law, not common man. Common law. And uh, there are some things there. Um, I don't know. I mean, you, you can really get deep into some of that. But when it comes to something like uh, marriage, uh, that's that's God's realm there. That a secular government has no right to get into that. Let me show you a scripture here quickly. Romans chapter 13. Um, uh, let's see which verse do I want to read? Verse 4. Talking about Romans chapter 13 verse 1. You can read down through, but we'll just read verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Okay, the purpose of God-appointed rulers, a ruler that's right with God, is the punishment of evildoers, okay, and protection of those that do good. 
they have no right getting into health care, they have no right getting into education, they have no right getting into religion, and they have no right getting into marriage. Okay, and so when you go out and you get a state marriage license, you are yoking yourself up to the state. It's essentially polygamy, in a sense, because you're married to your wife and you're married to the state. You have a license from them. And there are many cases where CPS or things come and they will give you all kinds of problems and, and possibly even take your children from you because you have a state marriage license, you have a birth certificate for the children. They're registered with the state. That's a problem. And I know that a lot of us have been through the thing of uh, birth certificates and all that other stuff and social security numbers. And again, how far do you take that? Do you get rid of your social security number? Do you try to do this stuff? Um, you know, it's an issue. And I don't know that there's a question coming up. I saw a brother had asked about how to get out of a state marriage license. We'll talk about that later. But if you're newly going into this thing, the main thing here to remember is uh, you're not doing anything wrong in God's sight when you say I'm not getting a state marriage license. As, and as a matter of fact, today with sodomy, you know, sodomites being given state marriage licenses, you know, you're yoking yourself up to that whole thing. Uh, Michael Pearl um, has, a, has some good articles and things on that. He, I saw on his website, uh, No Greater Joy uh, is, is his ministry. And I saw on his website his daughter, one of his daughters got married recently and no state marriage license. And he went off at the end about how that, you know, if you're getting a state marriage license today, you are literally yoking yourself up to the sodomites that also have state marriage licenses. So I highly recommend staying away from state marriage licenses. And you say, okay, well then what official permission do I need to have to get a co covenant or a coverture? You don't. That's the whole thing. Uh, you get married. And you say, well then how is it legal? Again, you're asking the wrong question when people say that. How is it legal? It's, it's something that God ordains. You know, uh, did you get government permission to read your Bible? I hope not. Some people in, in the comments, I think that they might. But, uh, you know, you don't get government permission to read your King James Bible. Um, you don't get government permission to witness to people. Uh, and in like matter, you don't get government permission to get married. Uh, the way a covenant or a coverture works, I'll explain the difference here in a minute. The way that it works is... You have witnesses there, uh, saved people, preferably the uh, parents of both the bride and the groom, so that they can, you know, you're giving an official thing there saying, okay, the bride is, is now coming out from under the spiritual headship of her father and is now under the spiritual headship of her husband. Uh, you're doing this thing openly. It's not the secret little thing of going off to a, a motel someplace or a cabin in the mountains and fornicating and then saying, oh, we got married. No, 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 no. You know, we, we both signed a little thing in the front of our Bible and, and now we're married and we can, you know, be together. No, that's not, that's not what this is about. Um, it's about a respectful thing coming out and saying, okay, uh, there are some saved people that I know. We're going to have them be there as witnesses. I don't have our Bible down here right now, but the, uh, David Hoffman's Bible, the Common Man Study Bible. Um, I know he has a channel now on YouTube. And he has in the front a marriage coverture. And it has everything that you need. And, you know, that is a legal uh, scriptural document. And again, when you have a legal marriage, then you don't go and you get, you know, well, I have a biblical marriage, but I'm still going to try to get the handouts from the federal government by writing off the fact that I'm married on my taxes. Don't do that. Don't do that. You don't want to try to go and say, well, I'm going to reject the state marriage license, but I still want the state favors. No, no. As far as they're concerned, you're not married. And again, that's no, there's no sin there. There's no evil there. They, it's none of their business about your marital situation. It's none of their business about your children. So, um, but to explain briefly the difference between a covenant and a coverture, a covenant is, is good. Um, you're basically saying that you've, before God, husband and wife coming together and, and things, um, it's, it's similar to a, a will be the same thing as a license, but you're not going to the state for permission. That's good. A coverture is the next step up from that, which I believe is the biblical way and, and which David Hoffman has in his Common Man's Reference Bible in the beginning. And a coverture is where the husband is pledging and saying, okay, I am going to be the spiritual covering for my wife. 
and you know that's what we have and I'll tell you what I really believe and the Lord's been really showing me this recently I really believe that when you get into that situation God holds the husband a lot more accountable uh, for the spiritual protection of the family and when the father starts to you know get a little bit away from the Lord and starts to act worldly or whatever else uh, the family starts to suffer for it. So it, it puts you into a relationship with the Lord where you're saying, okay, I am really accountable here and, uh, you know, I really need your help, Lord. And I've seen that thing. You know, there are times, I mean, I'm not, when I say I'm getting worldly, I'm not, you know, al drinking alcohol and partying and watching porn or something like that. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is I'll, I'll you know, start to watch videos uh, as research and I start to watch too many of those videos it starts to become entertainment and even something as simple as that I mean the Lord holds me to a, a high standard because I know I'm in ministry so um, it's the family starts to uh, suffer a little bit because I'm, I'm I should be spending my time reading the Bible and things and I'm ended up working on some projects here at my desk and while listening and researching and things and uh, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even think that that's bad, but you know, and it's not technically, but it's just like, I know enough, get back to work for the Lord kind of deal. But a coverture is, is a very serious spiritual commitment. And again, you know, it also binds you, truly binds you to your wife uh, for your life. Because if I go, if we would have a really bad blow up, my wife and I, and we go to the court system and say we want a divorce, you're not going to get a divorce unless you have a state marriage license. It, be, it would become very, very, very messy, if not impossible, to get a divorce if you have a coverture or even a covenant. So again, it's really, really binding you together. You have to stay together. And, and you know, if things fall apart, well, it's going to be my fault for it. So uh, that's why I am very much against the state marriage license system. It is a system of governmental control in an area where they are not authorized in Scripture to have any control. And I see people and they say oh, that I'm not lawfully married or something like that. Well, according to the government standards, no, I'm not, not lawfully married. Um, but according to God's standards, I am. We are. My wife and I. So, um, and, you know, when I say I'm not lawfully married under the government, uh, there's absolutely nothing that they can do. They're not going to come SWAT team us or something like that. Where's your state marriage license? You know, you know, put a uh, nine millimeter submachine gun in my neck or something and say, you know, sign the state marriage license or we'll, we'll kill you or something. But there are so many people that live together, you know, out there, and there's no marriage license with them. There's nothing that the government could do. Okay, they can't. It would be hip hypocritical for them to come after us because we have a marriage coverture, but not go after all the people that are living together, whoremongers, as the Bible calls them. So, uh, something to look into. Um, you can check out Michael Pearl, his his stuff on it. And um, I'll be saying more about him later. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, the Fallen Angel. Might want to change your username there. That's kind of a bad thing to have. Okay. Do you believe the Fallen Angels under... Semjazi uh, took wives of all they chose, creating the Nephilim, which were said to be giants. Okay, I have no what idea what a Semjazi means. Um, but, yes, I do believe in the Old Testament that the um, angels who left their habitation uh, came in under the daughters of men and bare children. And you can go in your Bible, your King James Bible, to that passage. And if you're using another version, if you're new to the ministry here, uh, you definitely need to use the King James Bible. It's the best Bible out there. It's uh, the one from the true uh, Hebrew and Greek texts. Um, and you're going to see all kinds of doctrinal errors in the other ones. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. I'll just read those. Uh, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Jump down to verse 4 there. When the sons of, of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were, were of old men of renown. First part says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So 
these sons of God were creating giants. You say, well, I think that they're just the sons of Seth. Can't be. Turn to the book of Job. And I've done other studies on this. I'm just going to hit it one more time because uh, this fallen angel here asked about it. Now, if you're a fallen angel, you should know what happened with the fallen angels. Um, I realize, you know, I've seen this a lot of times. You get somebody who's curious about, you know, Bible-believing Christianity, and they ask some good questions, and they'll have some really vile names or something, some really sinful, wicked names, and then they'll get saved and they'll change their username. I've seen that quite a few times. So uh, I would recommend changing your username. Um, but Job chapter 1, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro, to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Okay, The sons of God there are angels. They're in heaven. They are presenting themselves before the Lord. Okay, The Bible plainly teaches that. Uh, let me look up a verse here quickly. Try to do this as quick as I can. Job 38. I knew it was in the later part of the book of Job. I just couldn't think of where. Job 38, verse 7. Or, well, actually, we'll start at verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning st stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay, you read the context there. When the sons of God are shouting for joy, it's when the earth is being created. The foundations are being laid there. So, how could they be the sons of Seth or just regular people? They're there shouting for joy before the world was even created. Or as the world is being created, I should say it that way. So, the sons of God in the Old Testament is a reference to angels. Right? So, these angels did leave their uh, first estate and they came down and um, took them wives and they created a very strange offspring. Again, that's why you have so many legends ancient uh, Greek legends and things, mythology, where they'll talk about Hercules and how uh, you know this god comes down to this mortal woman and they have this amazing child and things. Um, I believe that that's what Goliath was. You read about in the Old Testament. I believe that he was one of these uh, fallen angel offspring. And you know, you say, is it going on today? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. Um, I don't think that these giants are being seen as of yet but uh and these weird offspring i think it's you know being covered up pretty well but i think it's going to definitely come back in the time of jacob's trouble uh pretty bad stuff <clears throat> next we have cats in texas cats in texas okay want to wish your family and you a blessed christmas and new year thank you um, they say this here i will end by saying this you sure have a lot of patience. You have not always been treated well, but there you go again inviting people to ask you questions. God love you, Brian. Even though I disagree with you on some things, I am probably one of the few people who defend you. But due to honesty, I still have to say I wish you would change some other views that are not doctrinally correct. But you are going to heaven, that and that is sure. Okay? Well, <clears throat> um, I don't arrive at my opinions and things and what I preach. I don't arrive at them just lightly or flippantly or because of my attitude problem or something. Um, I did a lot of research and study before I even entered the ministry. And again, I have to speak as a fool here for a minute, as Paul talked about, and that is when you speak foolishly as a preacher, you have to say a little bit of your qualifications, so to speak, and a little bit of what the Lord has done through you, and not out of pride, but out of just simply, I, I do get so many people attacking me and I just have to say occasionally, you know, I'm not just some YouTube uh, junkie that, you know, I got saved and I have watched, you know, a lot of videos on YouTube and now I'm an expert on the Bible. Uh, no, I studied for quite a few years before I even, you know, started in ministry. Um, I've preached on the street. I've gone door to door. I've witnessed to people. I have preached in Babel buildings. I've preached outside of Babel buildings. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've written articles. Uh, I don't write as much as I do video, but um, I've recorded audio sermons, you know, hundreds of them, and you know, I, I've I've done a lot of research. 
Okay, so again, I don't, and I'm not bragging, I'm not saying that out of pride, I'm just saying that as a matter of fact. And you say, well, then you've arrived, then you really know everything. No, no, um, if I'm proved wrong, then I will certainly change, and I will make that a public thing. I'm not too prideful to say I'm wrong. But uh, when I don't change, it's because I'm not convinced. Uh, I'm not going to change when I know what the Bible teaches. So, uh, but, you know, thank you for the encouragement. Next we have Joseph Fossa. Um, hey, Brian, can I talk to you? Please contact me at, and then your email there. Um, thank you, and God bless. Um, well, I don't really do much in the way of emailing. I have an older video on that. Um, I have, I mean, there are some people that email me that have my email address, and they're always very good with it. They will keep it short, and if they have to make it long, they'll explain to me why it's long and things. That's, and that's fine. But a lot of those people, I, I, there's just no time to answer people. Um, I mean, right now, as I said earlier, we're getting, uh, it's very cold outside. We're getting a snowstorm right now. We're going to get... Um, maybe as much as 12 inches of snow, according to what I looked at on the weather earlier. Uh, I don't have a butler or a groundskeeper that, that uh, plows the lane or even takes care of the plow or, or whatever else. You know, I do a lot of the work here and, and things. My wife has stuff she's busy with. We're extremely busy. So to have emails and all kinds of stuff, you know, close to 13,000 subscribers now, there's just no way. You know, people getting on the website and things, how can I contact you? Well, it, it's a problem right now. And I apologize to people for not always being able to answer and being able to email back and forth and things. I know a lot of people have asked for, you know, could you please call me on the telephone? I just can't do that. I mean, it's, it's, if I did that, then it would sacrifice the rest of the ministry and I'd never be able to get videos done or anything else. So, um, sorry, Joseph, but, uh, you know, if you want to, contact me about um, things just send me a private message that's about the best way to do it that's all I can say uh, Sharon Meek Sharon Meek Brother Brian could you please do a study on the Jezebel spirit now this is one reply I will or read here by a sister here um, Edlencia by his grace she says um, he did a two-part two study or two-part video, Nine Evil Spirits in the Bible, here on YouTube, but I don't see the videos anymore on his channel. However, it's on Sermon Audio in a video form, too, and here's the link. Um, and she gives the link, link there in Sermon Audio. Jezebel Spirit was one of the spirits, and it's taught in Part 2. I sent you Part 1 to get you there. I hope this helps. And Sharon Meek writes back, Thank you, sister. I have, I have heard these sermons, but it was a while ago. We'll give them another listen. Bless you. And thank you, sister, for giving her the answer to that. I appreciate that. Um, and I did talk about the Jezebel spirit in that study, so I'm not going to talk about it here again. Um, I had to take those videos off of YouTube because there was copyright. They were flagged for copyright violation, uh, which is nonsense. But I thought, I'm not going to go through this thing again. And so I'm trying to take down anything that violet, violates the copyright stuff here on YouTube so they don't shut my account down. So next we have... Jesus is Savior. Um, it says here, I have a question for you. What does your wife think about the idea of being changed into a man in heaven? Okay. Um, let me give you the answer to that first from the scriptures. Uh, let me see here. Uh, first of all, we'll go to Matthew chapter 22. Again, people say, so what you're saying is you believe, no, no. What does the Bible say? Okay, uh, I know I say a lot of things that seem to be very strange and very, you know, it's like the, the Athenians in the book of Acts chapter 17, you know, they're like saying to Paul, what new doctrine is this? What, you know, you bring strange things to our ears. Well, I, I know a lot of people think that about me. But uh, the fact is, if the Bible teaches it, then it's not me that's teaching it. I have some things that are purely my opinion. You know, I like vintage Ford trucks more than I like vintage Chevy trucks. There's no scripture for that. 
It's just a personal opinion. I like Kawasaki ATVs, you know, Honda ones if you go back far enough. Uh, that's a personal opinion. I have no scripture for that, okay? <laughs> you know, um, but when it comes to scripture, when the Bible says something clearly, then you go with what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay, study the whole King James Bible the whole way through, and you show me one time where an angel is ever said to be a woman. Not one time. The angel will talk with me. It was a man. The Bible talks about that over and over and over again. In heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage because they are as the angels of God. They're men. Which kind of makes a problem if you believe in sodomite marriage, men marrying mar you know, men marrying men, because they're all men in heaven, and the Lord says you can't get married here. You know. Another good argument against sodomite marriage. Let me look up another verse here quickly. I think I know where this one is, so we'll just turn to it here quick. Um, and I, again, I can't get into all the scriptures. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are, ye, now are we the sons of God. It's interesting, because in the Old Testament the sons of God are angels. Now are we the sons of God. Those ones that left their first habitation and fell in the Old Testament, Christians come in and replace them. Okay? Uh, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We haven't been changed yet. But we know that when he shall appear, Jesus Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. It's a purifying hope, in other words, the thing of being called up to be with the Lord. But you see, the thing there, we shall be like him. Him. Okay, and the, and the other parts of Scripture there uh, talks about that we're going to be changed into His image. We'll be conformed to the image of Christ. So I take that literally to mean that when all Christians get up there, we are literally going to be looking like Jesus. We're going to be men in heaven. Again, if you're a saved, you know, sister and you have a saved husband, uh, how's that going to work? You're going to be, you know. Wives submit to your husbands for all of eternity, you know. So that's what I believe. But the question was asked there, what does your wife think about the idea of being changed into a man in heaven? Could you come over? She's ever doing work here, so. You can just stay off camera. You don't have to, to come on the camera. Just come over to here so the microphone can pick you up. Over to here. Over here. Stand right there, woman. <laughs> oh, I know I'm funny. Okay, what is so? What is your opinion of your chauvinistic husband here? Well, first and foremost, if uh, if any feminists out there call the Bible uh, chauvinistic, you know, and ultimately men chauvinistic, then they need to check themselves and see whether or not they actually got saved, or if they're just, you know putting on a pageant and professing to be saved because why would you call God and his word a chauvinist? Okay? Yeah, they, they didn't say chauvinist, but I'm just being sarcastic. But what what do but you still, think? there's that mentality out there in this sure. world. Sure. What do you but think of it? I'm totally 100% in agreeing with, you know, I totally agree with, with the fact that I'm going to be a man when I get to heaven. I mean, let's think about this logically. Who was the first person that God created when God created man? I'll give you a hint. God created man. M-A-N. He created man first. Then he created woman. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the Godhead is male. M-A-L-E. Meaning, you know, God is a man. The Lord Jesus Christ is a man. The Holy Spirit is a man. So it logically and naturally follows that, you know, every single King James Bible-believing Christian here on this earth right now, before the time of, the, of Jacob's trouble, will be a man when we get to heaven. Because 
it logically follows that God, being a man, you know, his the body of Christ is part of a man. So why would you why would you have a problem with you know if you're a woman out there why would you have a problem with becoming a man when you get to heaven mm -hmm. because the bible clearly states that when we come back with the lord jesus christ to rule and reign with him as kings and priests let's think about this a king is a man a mm -hmm. priest is a man okay right. it says nothing about women in that okay mm -hmm. a woman would be a queen and therefore if if women weren't going to be men when they got to heaven well then god would have made an allowance for the fact that there would be both men and women in heaven mm -hmm. but then that would contradict the fact that the body of christ is part of the male godhead and the fact and if uh, there were women in heaven after the rapture well then that would contradict the fact that you know god says clearly in a number of places that a woman is not to usurp the authority of a man well you know you would have a contradiction yeah. there's there's so many scriptures that you can it's go just, over it's logical right if so. you read the bible you can you can understand english as it's written in the king james bible and uh you have common sense in your head you can clearly read the King James Bible and say, you know, we will be men in heaven. Yep. So that's the answer to the question. Yes. Thank I'm you. all for the fact that I will be a man in heaven. Yeah. Because I'm and part see, of the body of Christ. Right. I'm part of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I'm part of his body. Mm -hmm. So why would I say, I have a problem with becoming a man in heaven? Yep. It doesn't make sense. So, okay. See, she answers questions very detailed. So now get back over there and get to work. You know? Yeah. See, <laughs> so, you know, I have to enjoy my time down here. I can boss her around down here because I'm her husband. But uh, when we get to heaven, you know, well, she's going to be rewarded for her service as a Christian lady, as all my sisters out there will be. And so then uh, I won't be able to boss her around anymore. So. I have to enjoy it down here. But, uh, <laughs> okay, one more question, and then I'm going to stop this one. This will be the first part. Um, Christopher writes, Should all parts of the six-day creation be taken literally? Yes. Okay, and uh, the main reason for that, I talked about this in my study on dispensations, the fact that the seven dispensations actually line up with the seven days of creation, well, six days of creation, seventh day of rest. I'll say it that way. Uh, so it's very important. Um, but Second Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. God set the system up where He created the earth in six days. The Bible plainly teaches that. And it lines up perfectly with the 6,000 years of history. You say, but we're past the 6,000 years. It's past 2,000. We went to 2015. Well, I don't believe that our calendar and our dating you know, is accurate. I believe it's not truly 2015. Okay, in other words, 4,000 years of history leading up to the birth of Christ and then 2,015 years after that. I don't believe that's actually accurate. I believe it's a lot less. You say, well, what's the year? Can we figure it out? No, I don't believe we can. I believe the Lord has actually allowed it to get messed up by the Catholics, basically. They were the ones, um, Pope Gregory, I think it was, messed up the calendar, and I think that the Lord allowed that specifically so we wouldn't have the exact timing of the end times. So, uh, all parts of the six-day creation be taken literally? Um, yeah, I don't really see any reason not to. Um, I mean, you can get into the gap theory thing, you can get into day-age theory. Uh, there's a lot of different things, and I don't agree with either one of those. So, I believe it was created in six literal days. So, that's going to be it for part one here. Uh, we did Petra Paul the whole way down through Christopher, and we will start the next part with uh, Chief Jobu. So that will be it for part one here. Uh, I really like these questions. Um, again, if I do this in the future, 
I'm probably going to limit it to one per person and uh, hopefully be a little bit more refined with this thing. But, uh, you know, I'm just going through this. I have no preparation for this. I'm just going to read them as I get them and answer them as I can. So that will be it for part one. Thank you very much for watching.